going to continue to use it for cross-border payments, you know, where, where it works well. We're not going to make our customers use an inferior solution to make us, us happy. You know, it's on, it's on us to make XRP, you know, be a viable solution. I just want to make a point that, like, the current use for XRP is a tiny fraction of the things that people could be using it for. The market is so early, and, and we can't, it's impossible for us to cannibalize ourselves. It's like if, a mark, if, if, if an ecosystem is 1% of what it should be, trying to fight over that 1% is just that's not what's going to happen, right? We want to, be attra we want to grow the pie, and I think there's lots of room for XRP to grow, and there's lots of room for a stable coin to grow and to be used you know, in different use cases. There are some use cases where volatility is absolutely fine, and of course, in some use cases, like the AMM, where volatility is actually a plus. Mm -hmm. And there's the pivot. What is up, good people? Jungle Link here. Hope you're doing well. David Schwartz here to recap the XRP Ledger Apex event for us. Go over some of the big Ripple announcements that rolled out. And also filled some questions from the community. So <laughs> two of the announcements are kind of funny. So we announced the name of the Ripple stablecoin as Ripple USD. That's what probably most of you were calling it anyway. So not very surprising announcement. The ticker symbol RLUSD. Um, congrats to the Twitter sleuths who figured that one out before the announcement too. Um, that's, that's, by the way, Twitter sleuths are just absolutely amazing. You just cannot keep anything secret in the social media age. Then there was the announcement of uh, the name of the XRP Ledger EVM sidechain, which is the XRP Ledger EVM sidechain. I know again, I know, I feel, I know. I, I wanted to call it Niobium. I thought that would be super cool, but they're like, no, no one will know what that is. I'm like, I want a super cool name, but they're like, no, you got to call it what it is. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's important. Uh, I, I think some people have thought about it as just as like, oh, we have that too, just trying to check a box. But I think that's going to become a valuable part of the ecosystem, you know, with XRP as its native token and the, the Axelar bridge. Um, let's see, the other announcement was ArchX, which is uh, going to bring probably, you know, at least $100 million in tokenized real-world assets to the XRP ledgers, enterprise-grade tokenized securities, which are, you know, that, that's another one of those enablers for enterprise DeFi, you know, with, with being able to use them as collateral and rehypothecate and, and those kinds of things. Um, that's what builds DeFi ecosystems. A couple things. First of all, I think David Schwartz has given a very real compliment to all the Twitter sleuths out there, people like Mr. Hubert, DAI putting out a lot of information and just people out there putting in hard work on Twitter to bring up some very important information because make no mistake, that court case didn't just t take place in the courtroom. Part of it was in the court of public opinion as well. And the Twitter sleuths played a big role there. So I think David's given you a compliment with that one. When we're talking about the EVM sidechain, it's going to be important to be able to bridge over to other capable smart contract blockchains where you have the functionality to do certain things you need to do that you just cannot do on the main chain. We went over that a lot of times. I think that's going to be important. I think it's valuable. I'm excited they're building it out, but I hope their focus doesn't stop there. Again, it's my opinion. you got to pipe over onto the Ethereum blockchain, just like they're doing with the Ripple stablecoin, because that's where a lot of the value is. And you can add the most value to that because you can give high-speed payments and settlements to that system, but you can also draw a lot of that value that's already been built. So I hope they really expand where they plan to uh, bridge to and not just their their EVM side chain, the one they have uh, being built out now. Lastly, with the bridging, you know, I really wanted that capability to be core to the XRP ledger. They were looking at doing that. They decided to go with the third party solution here. And I think they saw that as the fastest way to get to market, the fastest way to get that up and rolling so we can really put a dent into RWAs and bring in a lot of value and assets onto the ledger. Uh, they made the decision we'll see how it plays out but it probably gets us you know scaling and working a lot quicker i don't know if it'll be long term better than having that is a native feature that you're doing on the xrp ledger but they decided that was the way to go forward we'll have to see how it works and the last one was the grant the geographic focus with grants in japan and korea which are areas Big. where uh, there's just been an enormous amount of xrp ledger development I'm not really sure why. It's kind of a little surprising to me, but I guess uh, those areas have just been major areas of innovation, and we have not, sometimes not paid as much attention to them as we should have. 
And so we're going to fix that. Awesome. Um, I'd love to kind of dive in a little bit deeper into some of the kind of, you mentioned bridges, but some of the broader interoperability work that you guys have planned. Yeah, I, that is a huge uh, challenge in the entire industry. Everybody is working on building better bridges and better connectivity. Um, as I've said before, users can't have to worry about how the technology works. If the, the path to mass adoption is when the technology just works and just solves the problem. Um, and you know, Ripple can't build every tool that people want. Ripple can't build a compelling ecosystem all by ourselves. People have to be able to access the products and services that work best for them. Asset portability is like the first step. That's not going to do the whole thing, but that's definitely a critical enabler. That solves like real problems that people have today. And asset portability through the Axelar bridge will at least enable XRP as a native token on the EVM sidechain, which is, I think, I think that's big because you know the XRP ecosystem was one chain, and the eco XRP ecosystem could be more chains if we had good bridging. Um, and so we'll have that for the EVM sidechain, but that's just a piece to the interoperability puzzle, and it's, that's not something that Ripple's going to solve. Mm -hmm. That's something that you know everybody in the industry is working on, and I just hope that gets better. Again, the path to mass adoption is when users. This solves my problem. You know what I mean? Like most people who use the internet have no idea how it works, and they don't have to. And that's always how you get mass adoption. You know, I was an early internet adopter. Anybody here edit DOS batch files for TCP with TCP/IP settings? Anybody that old? Nobody in this, oh, uh, yeah, one person, thank you. I'm not the oldest uh, internet user here. But like that's, uh, you know, the browser, if you look at the adoption of the internet, the browser, the graphical browser, does anybody use the internet before graphical browsers? Probably the same person. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it was fantastic for research and it was fantastic for keeping in touch with people around the globe, but there was no way it was gonna get mass adoption until it is painless and intuitive. And that's what we're gonna do with the bridging problem. But, it, but it's gonna take a while. And he brings up a good point to counter what I said is I, I think these solutions need to be native and not use a third party system. You know, they picked a system where they can bridge safely, which is important because that's a big security risk. You know, anytime you are bridging value back and forth between chains and, you know, he's he's delved more in depth into this issue in other interviews, but we don't really know exactly how this will work into the future. So if you pour a ton of money into developing it and building out some system, you know, in the future, it may pivot to a different solution. And so maybe you're better off just not to waste that time and effort. Let that area develop. And then, uh, you know, once there's some finality to that issue, like this is definitely the way we're going to go forward, then you can build that as a more native solution. I think they just went with the fastest, safest, and really most economical way to implement bridging features and be able to link up these chains. And we'll probably be revisiting this issue as we move forward. And as he said, a lot of different people, it's not going to be Ripple that probably ultimately builds that final solution, but a lot of different people are working on this and the bridging of the future will probably look vastly different than what we see today. Certainly. But another element that, um, you know, I think a lot of people uh, see as necessary for mass ad adoption are use cases and applications that do solve those problems. Um, so I really appreciate it, and I think it really resonated with a lot of people. Uh, the point you made earlier um, yesterday when you opened around inclusivity um, and being open to new use cases, new applications, uh, not just things that you guys are more top-down enabling at Ripple. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, over the years, have there been any use cases or applications that have been really popular that surprised you? Well, the explosion of NFTs kind of surprised me. Um, I get some of the financial use cases for NFTs, but the NFTs around collectibles and artwork, I mean, it makes sense now, but it was quite shocking to me how big that ecosystem grew and how quickly. That's calmed down a little bit. I think the other thing that was completely out of left field to me was the, meme, the whole meme coin thing and i think still that's one of those things that like it's cool when it's people having fun and you know you know but when you see people losing huge amounts of money because they thought that you know prices would go up forever yeah. um that's kind of a little bit depressing to me i do have to say the another thing that's been surprising to me is the way the political situation has changed in the united states in just the past month or so uh you know uh, one of the things that, that is amazing is like if you poll people in the United States, 
you will find that for people who care about crypto, they're almost all positive. There are very few people who are passionately anti-crypto. Yeah. Right? There are a couple, but like you in the weirdos voting... weirdos on Twitter. Right. There are people <laughs> who are niche people with unusual yeah. positions, but it's like in the voting public, the more passionate you are about crypto, the more pro-crypto you're yeah. likely to be. And so what started to happen in American politics is there's really no advantage to being anti-crypto, yeah. whereas it's a huge disadvantage because there are maybe 16% of voters who really passionately care. Um, and, and the sort of, you know, um, Coinbase going public was, was a sort of inflection event. I think USDC, which is a very regulated product, Mm -hmm. that's enabled completely, you know, has anonymous holders, yep. right? No, Circle doesn't know who they are. And it's enabled DeFi ecosystems that are on decentralized blockchains. So those kinds of rapid acceleration of like real, real utility, mm -hmm. uh, always uh, a pleasant surprise. I will say the one negative surprise to me has been the slow adoption of blockchain for payments. You know, um, Enterprise adoption for payments has been pretty good. That's what Ripple's been focused on. But sort of retail end user adoption for payments has really been slow. And I think like the product market fit feels good. The problem is last mile. Yep. So if you're a person who the only way to get money to you is to hand you cash over the counter at a grocery store or a post office or something, tech can't solve, the, there's no technology that can solve that problem. So I think that's been another drag to mass adoption and to being more inclusive is those on-ramps and off-ramps. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And what do you think kind of solves that last problem? Because before he gets into that, uh, it, it was amazing how quickly the political landscape changed. And it's for the reasons that David said. Yeah, for Elizabeth Warren, this is a big deal to be anti-crypto. But your regular person either... They're obsessed with crypto, and this is a big issue, and one they will vote with, and they will donate to uh, politics over. But if you're not really into crypto, you probably don't care that much about it. It hasn't harmed you in any sort of way. The average person, they're probably not anti-crypto in the way that Elizabeth Warren is, and that's probably because of their constituents and their donors or people that you know want them to attack this industry, but that doesn't align with the voters. And so as we are working through this election cycle, it very quickly became a political liability to be anti-crypto, and we've seen things shift so quickly, so fast, and this is why progress always wins out. It was never a question of if, just when we would start to turn the tides and really uh, you know, see mass adoption in this technology go mainstream, and that's what you're seeing in a big way, and David's absolutely correct. But our first question is around um, you know, really what's going to be driving value to XRP, um, particularly kind of around the cross-border and um, sort of more like enterprise payments and financial use cases. This is a big one. Yeah, so you guys can all see the question on the screen. Um, I think the big thing that's going to that's gonna keep XRP like in its central role is its privileged place on the XRP ledger. XRP is the only token that you can pay transaction fees in. It's the only token that every account can receive. The payment engine, entering pathfinding, always looks for XRP liquidity first. And XRP is auto-bridged through the order book. So XRP liquidity is sort of preferentially taken over to other types of liquidity just from order crossing. So XRP is always going to have a special place as a sort of liquidity tool on the XRP ledger. In the payment space, I think XRP, because of you know high, high, high speed, low cost and the sort of um, lack of things like MEV and um, you know block producers who are trying to tax transactions, it's going to remain a good intermediary currency for international payments. Ripple's going to continue to use it for cross-border payments you know where, where it works well. We're not going to make our customers use an inferior solution to make us us happy. You know, it's on it's on us to make XRP you know be a viable solution. But again, the big thing I think I, I think one of the things probably motivating this is the launch of the stablecoin with the idea that like one will cannibalize the other. I just want to make a point that like the current use for XRP is a tiny fraction of the things that people could be using it for. The market is so early and and. We can't, it's impossible for us to cannibalize ourselves. It's like if a mark, if 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 an ecosystem is one percent of what it should be, trying to fight over that one percent is just that's not what's going to happen, right? We want to be We want to grow the pie, 
And I think there's lots of room for XRP to grow, and there's lots of room for a stable coin to grow and to be used you know, in different use cases. There are some use cases where volatility is absolutely fine. And of course, in some use cases, like the AMM, where volatility is actually a plus. Mm -hmm. And there's the pivot. And first and foremost, it's okay. I've been actually harping on this point for a long time. You have XRP, three seconds of volatility versus a stable coin that's three seconds of counterparty risk, which is really better. When you're using XRP for payments, you have double the currency exchanges. You got to take US dollars, trade into XRP, send your payment, and then go XRP to pay so. That's double the currency exchanges, and there's a cost with that. Now, we may minimize that a little bit when we take some of this on chain, but still, you have more currency swaps, and someone's getting paid on each of those swaps. You know, I, I think that stable coins for a lot of payments, not all payments, but a lot of payments, the stable coin is going to be the better route. Now, of course, you have counterparty risk. Uh, whoever's holding your collateral can run off with it. But if you're streaming payments, if, uh, you know, any payment, you only have three seconds of that risk. If there's problems. You just stop using that method and you can switch over to XRP even as a backup method. I think this is the way we're going to see things go. And I think David Schwartz is telling us, get ready for that. And a lot of people are going to be upset, but listen, if a stable coin is a better way, a more efficient way to send a payment, if you force people to use XRP to try to build XRP's value, they're just going to use other networks where they use the better way, which is the stable coin. I think it's going to make a lot more sense. What David's trying to say is there's a ton of more applicable use cases for cryptocurrencies and those things we should grow XRP's use into. And, uh, you know, there's no reason to fight over these little areas where maybe stable coins will be better. It's a very small part of the, the total use cases that you could use XRP for. Now, why is this problematic a little bit? Well, you have this great story centered around Ripple, you know, sending XRP instead of flying suitcases of money around. Like people love stories and, and things of this nature, and it drives a lot of investment. And I think you're going to see some of those things challenge. Again, I've been talking about this for a long time. Stable coins probably the way to go for a lot of these payments, but there are still are use cases for pure cryptocurrencies. It's why even though you have Tether, billions of dollars, you know, it doesn't replace Ethereum. It doesn't replace Bitcoin. And Ripple stablecoin won't replace XRP's value, but it might replace some of that perceived storyline in people's heads that, you know, XRP is going to you know, be so much better than flying money around in airplanes and, and things like this. You know, the regular things we hear all the time. I think you're going to have to, you know, reevaluate things and figure out where XRP's place is in the grand scheme of things. Just my opinion. And I think David Schwartz is kind of dancing around that question a little bit. But I think that's what he's telling us here. Particularly for cross-border payments, you don't have to hold the asset for very long. So if you're thinking, well, I want to use an asset for cross-border payments, but I don't want to be exposed to its volatility, there are plenty of entities who consider exposure to XRP volatility a net positive, right? Like there, there are people, like if you wanted to have exposure to any cryptocurrency, whether it was uh, you know, XRP, Bitcoin, Ethereum, if you wanted exposure to it, you would generally pay for that exposure. That's why people hold Bitcoin, right? They want exposure to the upside. They pay for that upside. And so if you're worried about exposure to both the upside and the downside in payments, there are any number of parties who will gladly take the upside and downside you know, together. So it's not, it's not a, bound, a barrier. Makes sense. Um, I think with that, uh, let's flip to the next tweet. All right. Um, this is interesting. Um, around the 10-year goal uh, for XRPL uh, and, and what's really kind of changed over the years. In the very early days, I think my first vision or goal for the XRP ledger was this idea of public pools of liquidity that anybody could contribute to and draw off. So the idea was, um, let's say you needed to make a payment to somebody you know, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. What you would normally do today is you would find somebody who for a fee keeps money in Mexico to make that payment. They don't want to have money in Mexico. That's not their thing. They're just doing that to get your business and they're paying you for like the privilege of having that money ready to go in Mexico. But there's probably people who have money in Mexico who don't need it there. There's probably some guy who owns a chain of grocery stores in Mexico and lives in San Diego and he's probably paying 6% 
to go the opposite way, right? Everybody's trying to get money into Mexico. This is the one guy who's trying to get money out, and he's probably paying 6%. So I was like, oh, you have a niche use case that nobody else has. I'm the only, right? That's ridiculous. If we could bring those two people together, and that was that first, that first vision, the idea that like anybody who had money and didn't need it where it was could offer it to people who needed money there, a sort of global market for capital to reduce the need to pre-fund and pre-place. Um, I think that that's still happening. I think the, ch the challenge there is I don't think I realized how critical good on-ramps and off-ramps would be to making that work. Um, the technol again, the technology can't hand money to somebody who needs to have cash. I think the vision now is similar to what drove the adoption of the internet, similar to what uh, drove the adoption of like the international movements of goods, enterprise adoption that paves the way for retail ad adoption is I think what it looks like what's going to happen at least based on you know the, the past two years. So I think the new 10 year vision is enterprise products like stable coins, like real world asset tokenization, like you know commercial lending and real estate lending, but that enable DeFi ecosystems that have things like ways to get yield, ways to manage your money, um, ways to hold the assets that you wanna hold. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we should go to the next tweet, but it reminds me a lot of the <laughs> three-sided market you're referring to. All right, they're going to get into a goofy question here, but he's talked about this as well. When you look at DeFi services, tokenization services, and how that's going to really help the adoption of cryptocurrencies far more and quicker than payments. Because when you're using blockchain technology for payments, uh, you know that's just happening in the background. The user, the customer... They're not really, in their mind at least, uh, adopting blockchain technology. They're sending their payment just like normal, and blockchain in the background is moving the money around. With DeFi, when someone's using something for borrowing or lending or using a stable coin, these enterprise solutions, they're really taking the customer and throwing them on the blockchain and making them a current adopter of uh, blockchain technology. And so it's kind of pulling all of those customers along with enterprise and just pulling people directly on chain. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be really valuable. Uh, we're not going to get into this whole question about shampoo that David's using and stuff like that. You can check out the full uh, interview here on Bank XRP. He's got it up there. But, uh, you know, I wanted to play this part, these questions and answers, because I think you are going to see a little bit of a shift and you're going to see some change in the narrative on what XRP is going to be used for and what its value proposition is. You're going to see stable coins take over a lot of those uh, perceived use cases for XRP in the future. That's okay. I mean, you saw this with Ethereum, where really ICOs were, were the main uh, uh, driver of value for Ethereum. And then that became illegal, at least here in the U.S. And so you saw this great pivot to DeFi, which the XRP ledger is going through that as well. It's a proven you know, use case for blockchain. And then you saw this explosion of adoption and value and things like that. Sticking to old narratives ain't going to get you there. You know, this is a new technology that's just starting to roll out. And you have to see where your fit is. And what is the applicable use case for a technology and for an asset. And uh, again, XRP is a world-class cryptocurrency. Top 10 blockchain perpetually. And uh, I think we're on our way up the ranking and not continue to go down. We'll have to see it play out, though. And, uh, you know, how will the market react to this if we do see more payment volume running through stable coins instead of XRP? It doesn't bother me. On-demand liquidity, it didn't do a heck of a lot for the price of XRP. Uh, so I, I don't see a problem of using the network in its most useful way and building out, you know, better use cases for XRP where it is a world-class asset and it can, uh, you know, a stable coin can't do that same job. And I think that, like David says, there's many use cases. Uh, we don't need to fight over this one little one, even if it did make up a pretty darn compelling story for a long time. I think that's all it ultimately will end up being. Let me know what you think down below. As always, please like, please subscribe. The revolution will be televised right here on Jungle Link.